Hi, welcome. Tell me what you think about a market bubble. I'm sure most of you will say it's a bad thing, that we should stop investors from getting involved in bubbles. And if we can regulate away bubbles, we should do it, right? I beg to disagree, and in this session, I hope to tell you why. Let me tell you a story to, to set up how I think about bubbles. It was about three years ago. It was just before Twitter had gone public. It had filed its prospectus, and I was sitting at CNBC, waiting to get on for my two minutes of fame to talk about Twitter. And I was sitting with an equity research analyst who was very bullish on Twitter. And he turned to me and he asked me what I thought Twitter was worth. And I said, I, I don't have a number yet. I haven't done the valuation yet. It just filed its prospectus. And he said, save yourself the trouble. It's worth about $60 per share. I was curious. I said, why, why do you think it's worth so much? And his, his answer was, it's in the online advertising market, and that market is huge. So I was curious again, and I said, how big is that market? He said, I don't know. I can't give you a number, but it's huge. That's what I call the big market argument. It's the starting point for almost every bubble. In fact, to give you some basis for this, let me show you four markets that I've seen pointed to as big markets, and investors led in the direction of investing in companies in these markets just because these markets are big. There's, of course, China. It's amazing what a billion plus people will do to common sense, but adding a few zeros to how many units you can sell increases your revenues, your earnings, your cash flows. For about a decade now, we've seen China being used as an excuse for adding premiums to companies that have even the remotest connection to that country. There's the online advertising market. Google, of course, has played in that market for a decade, but in the last four or five years, we've seen social media company after social media company, starting with Facebook, come into the market, and each of them is promoted with this basis of there's a big online advertising market, and we can all make money. Then there's a sharing market, right? You, we, we've talked about Uber for the last couple of years, even though it's not a public company, as if it were a public company. $51 billion value, according to the last venture capital investing round. You got Airbnb, you got Lyft, you got companies in what I call the sharing market. And presumably, this is a market that's going to go beyond just cars or your apartments to other areas of our ownership, things that we own where we have excess capacity. in. And finally, the last couple of years, we've seen clouds, cloud computing, cloud data, cloud sharing. A bunch of companies in this space get up to very large market values, again, on the promise of a big market. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying any of these markets are not big markets. They can all be big markets, but often the only argument you can see given for many of the companies being pushed in these markets is, hey, there's a really big market out there, but if you push and ask how big, people are not willing to give you numbers. So the easy way to think about this is people in these markets investing in companies are in a bubble. And the reason I'm a little wary about using the word is it's a, it's a loaded word. The minute you use, use the word bubble, you're already passing judgment on investors in that market, right? You're making a judgment that these investors are being irrational, probably lazy, maybe greedy, perhaps even stupid. And once you do that, you've almost shut off every chance you have of learning from that market. I believe that markets don't do things randomly that even if you disagree with how a market works, there are things you can learn from that market and incorporate into your own thinking. So here's how I think about big markets and why it can get investors into this overpricing bubble. Let's assume you have a big market and there's an entrepreneur who comes along, sees the big market, creates a product or service that he thinks will cater to this big market and is able to convince venture capitalists to invest in his business. This is how business is supposed to work, right? So the entrepreneur sees the big market, brings in the potential, comes up with expected cash flows, values the business, and venture capitalists invest in the business. But let's assume that that entrepreneur is not alone and others see exactly the same big market. Let's say you have seven entrepreneurs all doing what the first entrepreneur did. They look at a big market, they've come up with their version of product or service that they think will cater to the market. They get their venture capitalists, people who believe in them investing in that business, and they each invest in the big market. You think, so what? If this were a rational environment where, in, where entrepreneurs and venture capitals were rational, they should take into account not only the size of the market, but also the competition that they're going to face, build that into their expectations and value their businesses, right? So if this were a rational marketplace where investors basically made unbiased estimates of the future, there would be no problem. But here's 
the secret ingredient that creates the overpricing. We know, and there's substantial evidence to back this up, that the types of people who become entrepreneurs and venture capitalists tend not to be diffident people. They're not the people who, sh- who they're, not, they're not fading violets. They, know, they don't shrink behind some, some space to hide. They tend to be overconfident. That's what makes them entrepreneurs and venture capitalists in the first place. And because they're overconfident, each entrepreneur in the space thinks that his or her product is the best one, and the venture capitalists who invest with that entrepreneur buy into that vision. So what does that mean? Each entrepreneur overestimates the probability of his or her success, and as a consequence, they each overvalue their individual companies. Are they being irrational? Only if you define overconfidence as irrational. It's human nature to be over- overconfident. The kinds of people who invest in this space tend to be overconfident. But here's what we know will happen as things start to play out, as the results start to roll in. First, the collective revenue growth at this sector will turn out to be lower than expected. Not that every company will deliver lower growth, but collectively, revenue growth will be lower than expected because they're all double counting the same growth. Operating margins will shrink over time because that's what competition does, and companies that are pushed to the limit will cut prices to be able to survive. And third, growth will become more expensive. You will have to invest more and more to generate growth because that's the nature of the business. So here are some general propositions about this overpricing story. It's always going to be there in every market, but the larger the potential market becomes, the greater the potential overpricing. In other words, if you're looking at online advertising as a huge market, you're more likely to see overpricing in that market than in a smaller market. So the larger the market becomes, the greater the overpricing. The younger a sector is in its life cycle, the greater will be the overpricing because you don't have any numbers on the ground to prove you wrong yet. So if you have a young sector with a big potential market, you can see how the, how the pieces are lining up for a significant overpricing. And finally, if you add in global networking benefits, sounds fancy, but this is a market where winners take all you make the overpricing even worse because each entrepreneur thinks he or she is going to be the winner who takes all, which means that when they're overconfident, it shows up as an even bigger mistake in their estimates. So if you have big markets with lots of young companies early in the life cycle and you have a global networking benefit, you have the trifecta that I think creates a huge overpricing. You can make your judgments as to which markets fit these, but I'll take you back about 15 years. This was exactly what the dot-com, the online e the e-tailing market, the dot-com retailing market looked like then. And to me, this is what the social media market looks like today. So let's take the social media companies and the online advertising market and let me get a little more specific about how this overpricing plays out. Over the last four or five years, we've seen social media company after social media company hit the market and find its way to incredibly large market capitalizations. Facebook is obviously the leader in the game, but you can go down the line from LinkedIn to Twitter to Yelp, a whole range of companies, all of which are trying to tap into the online advertising market. You've also got the old person in the block here, which happens to be Google. And over the last decade, you've seen how successful Google has been in online advertising. Now, each of these companies is being priced on the promise of a big online advertising market, right? So here's an interesting question to ask. We can observe the market prices for these companies. We should be able to back out from that market capitalization what we expect the revenues to be or what the market expects the revenues to be, say, a decade from now. To do this, you have to hold a lot of other assumptions constant. So let me, rather than talk in the abstract, let me take an example. Let's assume I looked at Facebook towards the end of last week, August 25th of 2015. Its market cap was about $245 billion. Its enterprise value is about $234 billion. I decided to figure out from that market capitalization how much revenues Facebook would have to make in 10 years to justify that value. So I made some assumptions. I made some assumptions about how I expected margins to change over time. And in the case of Facebook, I made the optimistic assumption that margins would stay what they are right now, which is 32.42%. I made assumptions about the tax rate. I made assumptions about the cost of capital. And then I solved for what the revenues would have to be 10 years from now. Sounds fancy, but if you have an Excel spreadsheet, which I do, and I can use the solver or the gold seek function, I can back into the revenues. So I solve for the revenues. I come up with break-even revenues 10 years from now. 
those break-even revenues, in this case of $129.4 billion, is what I will need to justify today's market capitalization. Now here's the final piece of the puzzle. Facebook gets about 91% of its revenues from online advertising. If I assume that that percentage does not change over time, that must mean the online advertising revenues I'm expecting for Facebook 10 years from now will be 91% of $129.4 billion. I can back out those online revenues. I do this for each company in the space. So just as I did, I'm sorry, for, uh, for Facebook, it wasn't 91, 92.2%. But for each company, I back out the imputed online ad revenues in 2025 based on the current value. Now, you can quibble. You can take issue with my assumptions. And in fact, if you really don't like my assumptions about cost of capital or expected margin, just go in and change the numbers. You can, you can actually access the Excel spreadsheets I have in the, in the links I will put up to this, to this webcast. But I've backed out the imputed online advertising revenue in 2025 for both U.S. companies and for companies in the rest of the world. Remember, this is not a comprehensive list. I tried my best to get the biggest players in the space, but I'm missing some players, obviously. But I'm also missing some players who might not show up as primary players in the space. As an example, I'm missing the online advertising revenues that the, that the Financial Times and the New York Times and the Washington Post and The Economist make online. I'm missing the online advertising revenues that Apple makes on some of its products. There are other companies that make online advertising revenues that I'm missing. You know what else I'm missing? I'm missing the private companies in the space that haven't gone public yet but have a pretty large valuation. As an example, Snapchat, $15 billion value. So if you look at the collective imputed revenues I'm projecting in 2025, $522 billion, I would argue that I'm probably understating that number rather than overstating it, that the true imputed revenues in current market valuations are closer to 600 or maybe even $700 billion. You're saying, so what? It's a big market. Well, let's see how big it is. Can it sustain revenues this big? If you look at what online advertising revenues were in 2014, they were about $135 billion. And total, re online, total advertising revenues globally, including all other types of advertising, were about $550 billion. Now, the total advertising market is going to grow, but not at huge rates because it's a, it's a cost item to companies. So I've given potential growth rates of between 1% to 5%. And we do know online advertising, which right now is about 25% of total advertising, will increase over time. And I've let it climb as high as 50%, which is pretty optimistic because it's not like the other advertising sources are going to go away. My best case scenario for the online advertising market in 2025 is about 466 billion. You're saying, so what? Remember on the previous page, my imputed revenues were 523 billion. That was an understated number. My expected revenues that I'm building into public companies in this space is already 115% of the total market. And that's going to be impossible to do. So what does this mean? Collectively, companies in this space, in the online advertising space, I think are being overpriced. Does that mean that each and every company in the space is overvalued? No, not necessarily. There will be winners in this space. There are probably going to be winners among my public company list, but it could be something that we don't that we don't see on the list yet. Either a private company that hasn't gone public yet, or a company that hasn't been founded. So what should we all do about this? Even if there's overpricing, I would argue there are lessons we can all learn. If you're a trader, you make money by buying at a low price and selling at a high price probably don't care that much that everything is collectively overpriced. After all, if you can get in as a bubble starts and get out before the overpricing ends, you're going to make money. That's, of course, easier said than done, but that becomes the recipe for success if you're a trader. If you're an entrepreneur, I know you're not a great believer in discounted cash flow valuation, but I think you can use it as a tool to keep your overconfidence in check. You can't make it go away. That's what made you an entrepreneur in the first place. But to me, discounted cash flow valuation is not just a tool to value a company. It's a template for managing the company, for getting a sense of what your own expectations are setting you up for. And that's a healthy thing to do. If you're a venture capitalist, it's all about picking the right entrepreneur and the right product, right? So the only advice I can give you as somebody who's never been a venture capitalist is don't fall in love with an entrepreneur and his product because that'll make you lose all perspective that you bring to the process. And if you're a public investor, the only suggestion I can make here is never say never. Never look at a sector and say, I will never buy a stock in that sector. At the right price, you should be willing to buy any stock, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, 
or a cloud computing company. At the wrong price, you shouldn't. So check the price and the value, and who knows? You might find that one underpriced stock in the sector. So here's what I bring out of this entire process. When I think about bubbles, I think of, of them not as a bad thing, but as a feature of markets. You can't make them go away. So that's why I view the attempt to regulate away bubbles, to pass laws that prevent bubbles from happening as misguided. I also think, and this is going to sound strange, that bubbles are a sign of a healthy market. A healthy market in what sense? Remember what bubbles come from. They come from overconfidence, people experimenting, people thinking they can do things that are beyond their reach. That's what's allowed markets to grow, economies to change over time. And here's what I'd like you to think about the next time somebody talks about a bubble as a bad thing. Ask yourself whether you'd rather live in a market with bubbles and with change and all the, and all the stuff that comes with change or in a, in a market where there are no bubbles and there's no experimentation, no change, and nothing ever is different. I know that bubbles can create side costs. That in some markets, at least, there are systemic side costs. And those bubbles we have to talk about restricting. But that's for a different webcast and a different day. Thank you very much for listening.